Hi, we're going through Cask of Amontillado, the easy text. The most important thing to consider with this story is the point of view and our narrator. We can't trust the narrator and everything that they, he is telling us because he is controlling the story and we only see what he sees. So a lot of this is also dramatic irony because we know more than what's happening to some of the characters in the story us as the audience and we have to go along with our murderers plan so keep in mind that we have some funky names we have Montressor it's a funky name but uh, using alliteration and epithets we can remember who he is he is a monster or murderer of the story so if you remember Montressor the monster or Montressor the murderer and even his name kind of looks like monster if you mix the letters around a little bit our other character that we have to pay attention to is Fortunato and his name looks like the word fortunate and the ironic thing about this is he is not very fortunate at all he's actually very very unfortunate because he's going to get killed <laughs> All right, so when you go through the text, you can see some of the answers here to the questions, and you can check your work. But pointing out some stuff within the lines, we have the start of the story begins with Fortunato hurt my feelings a thousand times. Now, this here is an example of hyperbole. We don't really know for sure if Fortunato really did hurt Montressor. And as you'll see later in the story, Fortunato has no idea that he did anything wrong to Montressor, yet Montressor set on killing him. Um, you know, this is a lot like your friends who you pick on, and you're like, oh, I picked on my friend, but, but he or she knows I'm kidding. They know I'm joking. Well, really? Ugh. Well, you hurt your friend's feelings a thousand times. You never show your anger, but one day you get your revenge. Hmm. Just keep that in mind. All right, we also have the W's here, our alliteration. We were, um, that's the repetition of the same beginning sound. And then highlighted in blue, one day I would punish Fortunato for his insults to me. So it wasn't until he insulted him somehow, we don't know what, but it wasn't until he insulted him that Fortunato, that Montressor decided to get revenge on him. Okay, now the method that he t goes to get revenge has nothing to do with like we don't get the method like right away you know Poe delays that he doesn't tell us the method um, but he just says that he's going to punish him in such a way that uh, Fortunato will know it was him that did it no it was Montressor but Montressor will not get in trouble for it and this is like the perfect crime you know it's the perfect crime He won't get caught, and let's see how he does it. Okay, so if you take a look here, in this paragraph, we got the same pattern of highlighted letters. This tells you, too, that it, this is an example of, and you should have said alliteration, and you'd be right. Okay, all right, so when you go through the rest of the text, we know that... Um, you know, Montressor tells us he's very critical of Fortunato's character, but he does say that he's an excellent connoisseur of wine, so our wine is going to be used as the bait. And conveniently enough, we see that he enacts his plan during late one evening during the carnival season, which is a lot like Mardi Gras. Now, this first section of the story up into this paragraph here, this is all the exposition. You know, from the beginning to the end and now right here this is where we're starting our rising action and that late one evening that's our big clue you know that the rising action is starting okay all right how convenient everybody's in costume which is very convenient for the, our murderer because no one will recognize him um, people may just see two characters walking down the street. Uh, you know, Fortunato is dressed as a jester, the colorful or motley outfit of a jester. Uh, no one, you know, they just may see two people walking down the street and they might not be able to realize what's going on. Now we have Fortunato is very happy to see him, Montressor, and Montressor is very happy to see Fortunato 
especially in his drunken state, because we know that he will be able to easily enact his plan with Fortunato being drunk. He can take advantage of him. All right, here I pointed out the verbal irony in this paragraph when he says, oh, you know, it's such good luck I've run into you. <laughs> well, it's not really all that great of luck, but whatever. All right, now we get the cask of Amontillado gets mentioned. It's a very rare um, and rich wine. Uh, during this time of year, it's very rare to have it so you know this is something that is very useful as bait because um, we know that since this guy is a connoisseur of wine he won't miss the opportunity to have that Amontillado okay so further into this story that you read and again check your answers on the side here we can see that Montressor even uses another guy by the name of Lucrezzi or Lucchesi to um, bait Fortunato and manipulate him and by using you know jealousness and competition Montressor can encourage Fortunato to go on down to the catacombs with him and again we have him baiting him and using reverse psychology especially right here by saying he pretended he didn't want him to go all right so they descend into the um, into the crypt. The damp air wrapped itself around our bodies. This would be an example of personification because damp air can't really wrap itself, but it's personification. All right, we know that Fortunato here as they go down is still uh, drunk because his gait was unsteady, his walk was unsteady. Onomatopoeia, jingling bells from his cap. We get this sound is used consistently throughout the story and repeated. Okay, so now they de descend into the uh, cellar and further into the caverns and we start to see the niter. The niter would be the mineral deposits that are hanging on the wall, you know, the, the things that create your stalactites and stalagmites in caves. So um, we get to see that Fortunato is coughing and we have more verbal irony with my poor friend and your health is precious we get even a clue here about motive because Montressor says to him you are rich respective respected admired and loved you are happy as I once was makes you wonder you know Mont this is really implying that Montressor is no longer happy uh, that he's no longer rich no longer respected no longer loved so this jealousy that Montressor has or maybe Fortunato did something that caused Montressor to lose business and to lose money we don't know we don't know and it seems too from the clues of Fortunato going along with Montressor that Fortunato trusts him you know and yeah he wants the wine but he, he's not alarmed at any point in this story when, Fortun when Montressor foreshadows that he's gonna get him you know and kill him all right, here we have too also the notice the workings of the madman. You know, he gives keeps giving Fortunato opportunities to go back. We will go back before you get seriously ill. He keeps giving him outs. Come on, we'll go back upstairs. And Fortunato keeps saying, No, no, I'm gonna go. So in a way, in the workings of a mad madman, Montressor can't be responsible because it's the choice of Fortunato to go down there. So, well, I didn't really kill him. It was his choice to go down there. Hmm. Workings of a madman. All right, we keep going down through the caverns. They stop at some more wine racks. Because of Fortunato's cough, Montressor gives him a medoc, a drink of that medicinal wine, so that he'll stop coughing and, conveniently enough, keep him still drunk. All right, now we get some toasting, and this is rather interesting um, because we get the verbal irony and dramatic irony the audience knows that Fortunato will not have a long life okay so here we get another clue too from motive the Montressors were a great and numerous family they're no longer great now like what happened that they're they're no longer great we don't know and you do get a little bit of like I forget what your family crest looks like asked Fortunato okay well 
Is he insulting him some way? I don't really know. Again, we only know what the madman knows. But we get this um, family shield. Now this picture here is just a picture of a family shield. It's not the picture of our family shield. But it says that it was a huge human foot surrounded by blue. That's the color azure. The foot is crushing a serpent whose fangs are biting and embedded in the heel. So the question becomes, is we have this huge picture, a huge fo human foot that's going to step on a snake. Does the snake bite the heel first? Like the person was, you know, didn't do anything to incur the, the wrath of the snake and the snake is attacking the human foot? Or is this the snake on the d defensive? The foot has stepped on the snake and bitten the foot in retaliation. Okay. And the next question you ask yourself too is, well, who's the foot and who's the snake? Is Fortunato the foot or the snake? Is Montressor the foot or the snake in this case? Because really, we have Montressor being very sneaky like a snake. He's living up to his family motto, no one attacks me without getting punished. Um, he's foreshadowing here. He's giving a huge clue to Fortunato that you've attacked me and now I'm going to punish you. But we see that Fortunato totally misses it when he's like, yeah, good. He's got no clue what's going on. And it just seems really odd that Montressor is a living example of his own family motto. Oh, just something to note here. Okay, so we get two more chances to turn back. And, you know, Montressor keeps giving him opportunities to turn back, but Fortunato says, nope, we're going to keep going. And then we get this also another clue from Motive. He talks about, and this is a weird part of the story, where Fortunato makes a gesture, um, a secret sign that Montressor doesn't understand. You don't understand the sign because Montressor is not part of the Brotherhood. A Mason has two definitions. We have a Freemason is the secret society. Very, very secret that nobody knows who's in the club. It's so secret. They don't even recognize their own members. And then there's also the job of a Mason. Now we get irony here because we're going to see by the end of the story how Montressor is really a Mason, a bricklayer. Now going back to motive, maybe Montressor wants to get back at him because he's not in that secret club of Freemasons. Again, we don't know because he doesn't tell us the motive of why he's doing this to him. We only have to guess it. Okay. All right, so to continue, they keep going down. He leads them into the back, of like the furthest corner of the catacomb and says, go on into that area. You'll see the cask in there. And Fortunato is so stupid, staring. You know, he doesn't realize like what's happening to him because he's drunk. And Fortunato gets chained to the wall by Montressor. And he's too surprised to fight him. He's also too surprised because he's drunk. Okay. The Amontillado, where is it? Well, there really wasn't any Amontillado ever. It was all used as bait the entire time. And then we get them walling up the niche where Fortunato is hiding. And eventually Fortunato will die from dehydration, starvation, and even suffocation because the air is not very good down there. Okay, And it will take him a few days to die. And also notice, Montressor doesn't have the blood on his hands. It's not like he stabbed him or shot him. So it's a very passive death. Montressor still is not responsible for his death. Okay, um, the screaming. You might have wondered about why For Montressor screams with Fortunato. And this is because he is showing him, instead of telling him, that no one can hear him. I'm going to scream with you and louder than you. And this is to prove to you no one can hear you. Fortunato makes um, a plea that hopefully that this is a joke uh, and it is not a joke. Um, we see no remorse from Montressor. His heart grew sick from the dampness of the caves, not from doing this. The wall is very solidly built because we also get the ending of this story where for 50 years the bones have never been touched and both have rested in peace. This is based on a true story, which I will share with you another time.